Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking. In today's video is going to be kind of a little bit different because it is the last video in our prerequisite series. A collection of videos I've created for those brand new woodworkers so that we can go over some general knowledge theories and stuff like that that will really help you in the beginning stages of learning this craft to avoid a lot of stumbles and ramp up your learning curve as quickly as possible so that you enjoy the craft more and produce better products. Today we're venturing out on a little field trip to a hardwood dealer, uh, which is quite a bit different than a typical lumber yard that is, uh, you would see at a big box store or a construction company would frequent. A hardwood dealer is where we're going to get the fine walnuts, maples, cherries, domestic woods, or even some of the local species that kind of define the style of your little region of the country. So, come along today as we venture out into the sunset to see some really cool wood. Now in my experience, this is kind of what a typical hardwood dealer would look like. And if you're looking for material to build furniture and stuff like that, search out a hardwood dealer. Not necessarily a lumber or building supply place, because those are going to be more focused on the construction trades. But if you look at this, I'm not going to tell you it is retail friendly. Uh, most of these businesses, they're kind of a niche of a niche of a niche market. They're catering to trim carpenters, furniture makers, cabinet makers, stuff like that. When people order from them, it's generally a phone call up on the, on the, they call them up on the phone and they're ordering thousands of dollars and lots of board feet and a lot, big crate loads of material. They're not going in to buy one or two boards. And honestly, I kind of think that them opening up to the retail crowd is more of a service to build up the craft because it is such a minute amount of income for them and it takes up a exorbitant amount of time for them to deal with a lot of new customers. And that could be why sometimes it might be a bit intimidating or they might be a bit abrupt because they know that, that they have a lot of work to do handling the customers that are buying the thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand dollars worth of lumber by the pallet. But that really shouldn't prevent you from venturing out and exploring here because they have a lot of options. And if you introduce yourself as a kind of a new woodworker that's your first time to a hardwood dealer, they will understand because to them you are also a new lifetime customer if they treat you right. At least the hardwood dealers that are going to be in business for a long time understand that principle. So on your very first trip, definitely go into the office, introduce yourself, tell them what you're trying to build, and they will actually be able to help you out in a lot of the smaller aspects. Don't just bring them in a cut list from the plans you have built. Uh, actually tell them what you're building and the style you're trying to go for. Give them a little bit of information. Don't, don't take up you know minutes of their time explaining. Just a short, quick thing. I'm building a little shaker table. I'm need one building out of this material. Here's a cut list they gave me for the plans. Uh, but if you could help me out, yada yada yada. And at that point, if they allow people to go into their warehouse to look through the wood, look through the material and stuff like that, they'll tell you that you have permission to do that kind of stuff. In the future, you'll know that, hey, when I come to this place, I could just go straight out to the warehouse to find out. But that's, more and more that's becoming a rarity. So you need to ask permission first. Now, when a hardwood dealer gets a material, this is how it comes. On a pallet, it has already progressed from uh, the person that cut down the tree to the sawmill that generally cut the wood up, at least in the United States, in variations of what they call a quarter. Four quarters is one inch, kind of makes sense. Eight quarters, two inch. Twelve quarters, three. Sixteen, twenty. I've even seen up to twenty-four quarter being sold at a lumber mill. But that is from the green wood. They section it up, and they cut it in those sections, and then they'll send it to somebody that's going to do the drying, the processing, kiln, something like that. At that point, that four quarters, eight quarters, twelve quarters, is going to shrink a little bit. So you're not going to get the full one, two, or three inches. At 
that point, there's also another process where a lot of times they would do something called skip planing. And that's where they would just lightly surface the front, the top of it, because as wood's drying, it's sitting out in the air drying rack, then, then it comes into the kiln and stuff like that, it gets fuzzy, it gets dirty, and it's sometimes hard to tell what the wood grain is going to look like. By just taking off the slightest little bit, the fuzzies, so to speak, you get a clear picture of it. And that's part of the material that any woodworker was going to remove anyways when they got back to the shop. It's just nice that when you're looking at the raw lumber, you can see the texture. Again, that's an extra process, so you end up paying for it. I personally appreciate hardwood dealers that do that kind of skip planning work because it allows me to pick and choose the boards I want a little bit more accurately. Now a lot of times when you go into a hardwood dealer, you're going to see them, the wood, in stacks just like this. It's because most dealers do not let you really pick and choose what kind of, what the exact boards you are getting. That is a true luxury. The reason being, a dealer gets in a stack of wood like this. Well, that entire pile is graded on an average. They're going to say that, I'm just going to make up terms, but that pile right there is A-class material. Well, 90% of that is probably going to be A-class. Then you might get maybe 5% of its B, and then a C-class board might have accidentally slipped in there. Well, if somebody is selling that amount of wood every week to just the general public, if they're coming in and picking and choosing, well obviously people are going to pick away the 90%, leaving the 10% that's B and C class that isn't going to sell. And the customers are going to ask them to open up a new batch, a new pallet of wood. They'll put it up in there and once again the A's are going to be picked off and the B's and C's are going to be left. So you do that for three stacks and all of a sudden you have an entire shelf of retail material of a lower class that people don't feel justified that they should have to pay so much. So they end up losing money. But if you're a commercial retail shop or a furniture shop or stuff, you kind of understand that there is a variable there on the quality of wood that you're, you're buying. That is why so much of us have been driven into our, our heads that you buy 10, 15, 20% over so not only can you pick and choose what parts come out of which boards and get the best section over there, but if you get a few off boards, it's not that big a deal. You can set them aside and use them for something else or section use smaller por portions of that board in a better pro project You don't need if you don't need the full length. That's kind of built into the system, which is why most hardwood dealers I've ever been to they don't allow people to pick and choose. It's just it, boards start coming off the top as you buy it. Now you can tell that person, hey, I need in my order a certain number of boards that are this wide or that wide or something like that. And if they can accommodate that, they will. Otherwise you're gonna to have to be gluing it up. But that is somewhat common request in the industry. You just can't tell them, I want all the boards to be a foot wide when you know you're going to be cutting them up into two foot sections. That's just, that's just not fair. But also understand, once again, their target audiences of this business isn't the person buying one, two, or three boards. They're not targeting people buying $100, $200, $300 worth of material. They're buying, targeting people that buy the entire pallets. And as you can see on the ends of these boards are little sales sticks of companies that have just bought the entire pallet. But, if you're buying a large volume, 400, 500, 1,000 board feet, ask the hardwood dealer. A lot of times they give price breaks for those volumes because they themselves don't have to handle that material as much. So it's less labor for them. They just have a pallet come in. It's 1,000 board feet. You buy about 1,000 board feet. They pick up the pallet, put it on a trailer, and take it out to your place. Fairly simple. They're not having to sort that stack for you. But if you're lucky, you will have a local dealer to you, like we have fine lumber and hardwood in Austin, Texas, that does allow their customers to come out to a section of the warehouse and pick through the materials. And they have a variety of types of materials. For instance, this entire wall right here 
is what they call rough sawn material. It is basically straight from the lumber mill. It goes through the kiln, and that's the end of the processing it, unless they skip plant it. Let's take a look. So right here we have some 12 quarter poplar, and that's one of those species that I highly recommend new woodworkers start out learning on because it's fairly inexpensive. It's actually a kind of a secondary wood that people use on like drawer box sizes and parts that don't show because when it is freshly hewn, it has a slight grain tinge to it. My workbench in my shop is actually built out of poplar, but over time it darkens and you can get some nice coloration to it, but it isn't the normal wood grain look. It's more dark streaks and stuff like that. But it is great to learn on because of its cutting characteristics. Well, as you can see, none of these boards are flat. They're cut, they have cracks in the end a lot of times, they're rough on the sides. All that is characteristics of it coming straight from the sawmill, going into the can, and ending up here. Because there are less human interactions with the wood, less machines that it's going through to make it pristine, flat, square, all that kind of stuff. This is the cheapest material you can buy at a hardwood dealer. You just have to have the tools or skills to use the tools to process it to get it to that straight, square, flat, and smooth uh, board that you put in your, your work. And rough saw material does come in different thicknesses. From six quarter, which starts out about an inch and a half, that's probably going to be an inch and a quarter when you get it after shrinkage. And remember me talking about skip planting. Well, here's an excellent example of it. You can see it's just kind of touch, skim the top, but it's not making it perfectly flat. For example, right here on the sides of this one, you still have a little bit of that roughness from the bandsaw mill or the, the circular saw mill. It's just touching it enough so that you could see the grain pattern that you're buying. Now, I will say in Europe, Eight quarters is generally the smallest you're going to get in rough sawn material. In this country, we do go down a little bit smaller, but eight quarter seems to be where the most of the sawmills uh, target as far as they're harvesting the trees and stuff like that and going through that entire process. So that's probably going to be your best value. Once you start going above eight quarter, prices tend to start going up because you have to spend a lot more time in the kilns. They're spending more resources to heat up the wood and extract the, the moisture because the thicker it is, the longer it takes to do that. Now, if you don't have the resources to mill up the rough stock, they do provide pre-milled material. And they call that either an S2S, where they will smooth one side of it and square up one side, and the other side can be wild could even have bark on it, you never know. But that's squaring it up so that you could put that through your table saw safely. A board like this is S4S, where they have flattened one side and then made the opposite side parallel. They've straightened one side and made the opposite side parallel. But as you can tell, there might be a slight waviness on these kind of boards, so you are going to have to refine it a little bit but it gets closer to the quality of dimension material that is safe to use in a lot of the common woodworking tools we have in our woodworking power tools we have in our shop. A hand plane can handle just about anything. But once again, every time you introduce another step that the hardwood dealer has to do to the board to make it something attractive for you to buy, the price does go up price starts to go up pretty dramatically when they start doing the processing for you. The measuring convention also changes a little bit whenever you start talking about the process materials and they start referring it as one by sixes, more of what people are associated with something from a big box store. But just like the A quarter, six quarter and stuff like that, you're not always going to get a full one inch thick board whenever you buy a one by six. For the simple reason that, once again, is referring to the size of the board before they started doing the work for you and processing in a way to get it to something that you could use. So most of the time, when you buy a one by something, it's probably only going to be about three quarters of an inch thick. So if you're wanting a true one inch board, you might need to buy a two by something and mill it down a little bit more yourself. Now, because these boards come straight from the sawmill, you will find 
what we would call errors in our our work things like cracks and stuff like that that is not always a defect in the board you are buying they are selling this 12 foot long board as it is so to speak though whenever they are pricing it if you're a really good customer or you have a hardwood dealer that has worked it into the price a lot of times you will see little chalk marks or something like that with a line here saying that they are only pricing that much of the board but whenever they do that one they generally for the entire stack will have to charge more per board foot for the board because they the hardwood dealer had to pay for this material and now they're just giving it away so they've got to work it into some way into the price in order to be fair now this material whether it is sold rough or dimensioned is sold by the volume it's not a board price you're paying for the cubic inch of material and the unit measurement they typically use is something called a board foot it's easier to explain that one on the whiteboard so we'll have that to my shop for that one now board feet is a measurement on the cubic inch scale a cubic inch is if you take a one inch by one inch by one inch block height width and depth you multiply that amount and you basically get one cubic inch so if you take a square foot board that is one inch thick but you have 12 inches going across 12 inches going down and only one coming up so 12 times 12 times 1 equals 144 cubic inches and that is one board foot a foot in one direction a foot in the other direction now because this is a measurement of volume you can reorganize this any way you want for example if you had a board that is six inches wide and two inches uh, high and 12 inches long well, that 2 equals up to 144. In fact, that is a very common measurement. You will find a lot of times rough stock boards are cut into 8 quarter material, which is 8 divided by 4 is 2 inches, and it's 6 inches wide. It's just a very common section. So if you have a board that is 8 feet long and 8 quarter, that's 6 inches wide, you pretty much know you have eight board feet. So however you can multiply the math to come up to with 144 cubic inches, that's a board foot. Other things that can affect the price are obviously the species, but in addition to the species, it's the type of cut that the board is, be it a quarter sawn, rift sawn, or flat sawn. And once again, easier explained on the whiteboard. Now this is a quick review. We covered all of this in the uh, class on wood earlier in this course. But if I were to split a tree in half, like on a bandsaw mill, cutting it up, right down the middle, another slice, another slice, another slice. So we end up with boards that look kind of like this right here. Well, we always know that the pith is trash, so we're going to cut that out. And now we end up with two boards where one of the faces, the grain is coming directly into it at 90 degrees. And that is incredibly important in some species when you're going for the medullary rays, because they are uh, migrating out from the center of the tree and if you get slightly off on them, you're not going to see them. So these two right here are called quarter sawn boards. If I were to split this board in half, kind of like that right there, well, these two outside boards, because the, the grains are coming in at about 45 degrees, they're called riff or bastard sawn. And because this grain right here is running across the board pretty much side to side, that is called flat sawn. Now, I'm sure you can see that if you're just bandsawing up boards, like you see most of the trees being cut, this is the most efficient use of the entire tree. Because pretty much everything of it is going to be turned into a board, with the exception of the pith right here. 
which is always trash. But if you look at it, out of this entire thing, we only have two board, four boards that we can sell as quarter sawn, and they are highly prized. Everything else is just a variation of riff or flat sawn, which, you know, you can get a lot of that. So what happens is a lot of lumber mills have started coming up with different ways to maximize the uh, ability to get more quarter sawn material out of a board. Now sometimes they will do the same exact thing they did originally and they will cut a log in half. Okay? Then they will rotate the log sideways, then they will cut it in half again. Okay? Thus getting four separate logs. Each one of those logs they will come through and they will cut out a section like this, a section like that, and once again, assuming the pith is trash, well all of a sudden they just ended up doubling or quadrupling the number of quarter sawn boards they got out of the tree. But only this face right here this face right here, that face right there, and that face right there will have the best medullaria rays, or however way, mount, way you pronounce that. Because, as you can see, the grain is slightly curving off of 90 degrees right there, which will get some, but not as much as that glorious face. The rest of the log, they will continue to cut up, but that's more getting rifts on and flats on boards. The other way they can truly maximize the amount of yield they get out of a board going for quarter sawn is they will be able to grip the log and rotate it and then they will make one cut going straight through the pith then another cut going straight through the pith another going straight through the pith and going all the way around. This center section is still going to be trash. But if you look, each one of these can now be recut along the axis that goes straight through the center. So these are all going to have at least one face that has a grain at perfectly 90 degrees. But you notice all that is now waste, all that is now waste, all that is now waste, that is waste, that is waste. There is a lot of waste in the material, but you will end up getting as many of those, those cross-section cuts of quarter sawn material as you can do. But in both of those cases, not only do you increase the amount of waste, but there's a lot more man hours and technology and machinery that has to go into account in order to rotate the board, the, the logs or rotate the saw in order to make those cuts that are going to go straight through the pith and return 90 degree edges of grain on the face of the board. Now white oak is one of those species where quarter sawn material is put as a premium because the flecks that, flecks that come out of the medulla rays, medullary rays, or however you pronounce that, are just gorgeous, and they're kind of a key aspect of mission-style furniture. So it is a lot more expensive to cut that out, as you saw, and get a consistent quarter sawn material. There's a lot more waste, so if you're buying quarter sawn white oak, which there's an entire mar market of sawmills that that's all they produce, it's going to cost you quite a bit more for the simple reason of the added labor and the increased waste. And finally, in some species, where at some times of the production cycle, where there's increased demand or anything like that, sometimes you'll pay a little bit of an extra premium for the widest of boards. They'll put out a document that says if the board is more than 12 inches, add another. 10 20 dollar to the board foot you're paying for that saves you labor if you're doing a glue up 
but it's just so much more rare to find trees of that size in certain species, so they're worth a premium. And there's, and there's one kind of last thing I want to talk about, about pricing, is that it is not static. It can't be. This is a commodity product. Uh, you know, sometimes, some years there might be more cherry available, so prices might come down. Some years there might be a blight and it kills off all your white oaks. So you'll have more of that material coming into the pipeline, but then two years later it's going to be scarce because so many of those trees died, they don't want to harvest as much than the following years until it works its way through the, through the wholesale environment. And prices of the what they buy from the distributors, well, that can vary daily. Your hardwood dealer is having to adjust their prices for what they buy it, and that could be different for every single pallet they get on on main main boards like cherries, maples, that kind of stuff. It's not going to vary that much from week to week, month to month, but it's not going to be the same. So when you go in or you call in advance. Ask them what their current board foot price is. But if you go back a week or two later, don't be surprised if they had to adjust it. It's just, they're trying to make a living and there's so little margin in this business. I'm surprised some of these places like Austin Fine Lumber have been around for, you know, generations. But one of the cool things about a good quality hardwood dealer and the fact that they are here to supply the pros out there is they have a wide selection of some stuff that you really might want to play around with that you won't find anywhere else, such as a huge variety of sheet goods. Well, it's going to be graded on the quality of its face and the quality of the back. Those have two different ratings in addition to the quality of the core and the various types of cores. For example, this has a C core, which is a good mid-grain. Some people will call this a bottom level that you would use for uh, doing clear finishes on wood and stuff like that. Anything below that, the variations of the core will show through in the type of finish you use, Some, which is why below that one, most people just do paint. Some people, well, you know, a decade ago, C would have been considered paint grade, and Bs and As would have been finished grades. But times are changing, and to keep the prices down low, C grade is where a lot of people are putting finish on nowadays. The quality of the cores can also dramatically influence the finished look of your project. Uh, this being a B grade core, well, this is a laminated material. Now, if the manufacturer is trying to bring in a lower price product, they might actually mix up different woods with different densities. So when you sand it, those differences in densities will come out. Kind of like if you've ever sanded something with a hard, uh, a hard early, uh, hard late growth in a soft surf, uh, early growth like pine. As you run sandpaper over it, you kind of take away a little bit more of the soft stuff. That can handle here, and that will telegraph through. So the higher the quality of the uh, core, the less telegraphing you're going to get. And that includes things like gaps, because certain species like maples and stuff like that will telegraph a gap a lot less than something like, you know, an oak or a cherry. And you can even get things like combination cores. A lot of plywood, they would do just a straight MDF core, uh, just to make it nice and flat. But other times they would do this trendy the striation for the strength and the durability, but on the very top layer, they will put a thin coat of MDF. And they do that one when they're doing thinner veneers on top. Now, the way it's been explained to me is that imported veneers, you know, they're generally like a fraction of a millimeter. But in this country, domestic veneers, they're, they might be a 32nd or 64th when they make it, but the final process has always been to sand it down. So that 64th will get a little bit less than a 32nd in the end, but that's still quite a bit thicker than imports. I'm also being told that the entire industry is somewhat in a transition right now, and even the domestics are going to eventually become thinner and thinner and thinner, and putting that thin layer MDF is one way they can do that one without reducing the quality that much. The downside is it is thin, so you can't sand it as much when you get back to the shop. Give and take. Other options that are available to you at a hardwood dealer that aren't always available to you in a big box store is the type of veneer that's on that place. For example, this one right here is kind of 
boards, slabs, sections. So it looks more like a glued up board. Where a lot of times they are more radial sawn, where they're just kind of peeled off of a log, so it looks more consistent. Now, if you're just doing paint grade, that's perfectly fine. And some species, like maples and stuff like that, they look okay with that. But if you start getting into oaks and you're doing that radial cut, I'm telling you, you're gonna think it looks ugly. That's why the boards look so much, they have that option of the boards because it just looks so much better. You see, when you come to the hardwood dealer, options open up. And if you have an idea that I want a nice, smooth dining table, you come in and you ask the person, what kind of core should, do I need for this kind of stuff? Do I need a thicker veneer? What type of veneers do I want? How do I want to get it cut? Do I want to get it oversized? Because, you know, traditionally we make four by eight sheets, but places like this can order, it's very easy for them to order slightly oversized, like 48 and a half inches. So if you're putting on a CNC machine and, you know, you have a thicker curve on your bed, you can still cut out the same shape. They do all that kind of stuff. They can even cut it down for you. There are a lot of services that uh, most hardwood dealers offer. So if you go buy something like that rough saw material because you want a really thick slab material, well, guess what? They have the machinery, skill, employees, and ability to handle that stuff for you very efficiently. And mostly it's a very reasonable cost when you consider that they're having to do all the maintenance on the machines and buy the machines and stuff like that. If you're working out of a small apartment and you want to do something unique with specifically thickness material, well have them do all the heavy work and then you can do all the fun joinery work with your hand tools and end up with pro level quality furniture without having to invest a lot of that resources yourself. Another product that is really attractive to the pros but a lot of us amateurs might not always have access to is trim pieces. All different profiles, all those classic stuff that you take out of your restoration home or something like that, chances are they have that profile here or they have the means to efficiently make it. So there you go. In this series, I hope you now understand the basics of what the tools you have access to, what you can do with the tools, the material you're doing, and now where you can buy it. Because this right here is our toy store. This is where our imaginations come alive. And if you, even if you don't intend to buy materials and you have access to a hardwood dealer that would let you kind of look through their warehouse, which is kind of rare nowadays, Go buy some time, walk through, maybe ask a question or two. They understand that you're new and you could become a lifetime customer of theirs. And if you have your very first project, bring in your plans, talk to them, ask them, hey, would it be better to use plywood for this tabletop, maybe trim it out. They have the experience and knowledge to give you good quality advice and they can tell you why certain things might cost more but in the end, save you money in the processing you can avoid or the errors that come out. Nothing more frustrating than to spend a good amount of money and then when you lay the finish, all of a sudden see transparent remnants of the cores coming through on your plywood. And stuff like that could have been saved by spending an extra 20, 30 bucks on a sheet to upgrade just one or two levels. These people have that kind of knowledge. They want to give it to you. So while these kinds of places might not be overly retail friendly, they're not going to serve you a cup of cappuccino or anything like that, I do encourage you to go out and visit, explore, and learn. And learning was what this entire prerequisite course was all about. You should have more than enough knowledge to confidently start making sawdust enough knowledge to be able to ask the right questions of the experts in your area or just the slightly more experienced woodworkers and somewhat be able to judge the response on whether it's valid or not. You've explored the tools, the material, the techniques, all that kind of stuff now. Time to start making some sawdust. This was the last class in the prerequisite course series. Uh, just broad information. Uh, I kind of think of it as like a freshman level class. Lots of theories, lots of discussion, lots of thought processes. 
not so much a lot of hands-on exercises. But that's going to change in our sophomore level series. So I hope you'll follow up in the future with those courses as we'll dive deep into certain areas of the uh, craft, such as wood turning, carving, green woodworking, timber framing, regular construction, or just the DIY kind of woodworking so, mon so much of us enjoy. And that'll be the first one produced after this class series. I'm calling it the Start Woodworking Series. The first one of those is already out where we built this workbench. But please remember, I and a lot of other content creators on all different kind of platforms depend upon you, our audience, to help subsidize all the time and effort and expense it takes to create series like this, nine episodes for the beginning woodworker to give them the best start at being successful in the craft. It's kind of a value for value proposition where we provide the value first and hope that we can get a little bit back in return so that we can just continue doing this. It's not a huge money maker. So if you'd like to support this effort or any future effort, you see value in it for yourself and others, check out in the description down below because I have lots of different ways you can help us out. And congratulations for finishing the first course on your path of becoming a woodworker. And when you do, remember that it is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.